Oh, let's do something special this morning. Hey, hello out there in TV. <laughs> Got some extra camera work going on here, I see, today. So you may want to edit this first part. Um, We've got a baby dedication, so we're going to ask the Morgans to bring baby Jonathan and all that you have brought that you want up here with you, grandparents and anyone else that you want up here with you, aunts, uncles, cousins. You did give him the Benadryl Mickey, right? Step into the spotlight with that young. Uh, oh, look at that little foot. Oh. <laughs> he probably isn't going to like those lights, but um, welcome everybody. Just line up so everybody can see your wonderful faces. And just so, so happy anytime that family comes to be a part of this. Um, and you being here confirms what I feel about baby dedications that it's not just a religious event. It's not just the mechanics of Christianity. This means something today. We absolutely believe that when we do something like this, that we're loosing something in the earth and loosing something in the heavens and, and that it matters what we're doing right now. As a statement, this father and this mother joined with extended family is declaring before God and men, this child belongs to God first. And the Bible says that, that when baby Jonathan was in Erica's womb, that God saw him. And God put his great big giant hands in there somehow, and he knit his body parts together. And he decided how tall he's going to be, what color his eyes is going to be, what color his hair is going to be. He put within him natural abilities, spiritual abilities. Spiritual giftings are already housed inside of this child. And God put all that in there, and we believe the only thing that prevents that from coming forth in a child primarily is the way that a child is raised. If we raise a child in the ways of the Lord, the Bible says that when they become older, they will not depart from it. And so it matters how we raise our child, and it matters if in our heart we're giving our child back to God today. This is Jonathan Michael Morgan, and uh, he's a keeper. And our neighborhood's getting bigger and bigger up there all the time. As long as the Morgans stay up there, it looks like our, our neighborhood's going to get bigger and bigger. And this is not the end. There has to be a daughter here somewhere. <laughs> Does the whole family agree with this? <laughs> Who's babysitting is, is the only information that Granny wants back there. And <laughs> um, I want to pray this morning, first of all, for the extended family. You guys have have learned through past experience with children. You know how this works. You all have so much experience. You've been there. You've done that. And, and now you just have to temper it all with wisdom. Know when to step in and know when to step out. Know when to come in and say, you know what? Here's just an idea. And know when it's a good idea just to step back and say they've got to find their path on their own this time. So we appreciate the role that you guys play. And so, Lord, I lift up extended family today. And I thank you for the role, Lord. Um, Lord, I... I I can realize within my own life the importance of, of a grandfather and a grandmother and an aunt and an uncle, Lord, and just those, those many roles that were played in my life bringing me to the point that I am right now. And I know, Lord, that you have handpicked certain occasions and moments in life where they'll be so instrumental in Jonathan's life. And today, Lord, may they find new portions of wisdom and patience, Lord, and grace to help raise this child in your ways, oh God. And Michael and Erica, um, a baby dedication, it started long before today and it lasts much longer to, than today. Um, this is just a, a moment in time where you're making a statement. Here is our pledge before God. We will raise this child in the ways of the Lord. Every day is a dedication. Dedicate, to sanctify, to anoint, all those words mean the same thing. They mean the same word as, as the same thing as the word holy. They all mean to set apart, to sanction, and say, this is the purpose for this. And Jonathan's purpose we're here to de declare today is for the purposes of God. And so we pray for this father and this mother, Lord Michael and Erica. 
Lord, as they've brought forth another child and a beautiful, perfect child, Lord. And Lord, he, he will not be the same as a past child. Lord, our future children, Jonathan Michael will be unique and he'll have to have some unique counsel, some unique discipleship. And today, Lord, I pray for extra portions of wisdom for even the spirit of prophecy to be so alive in Michael and Erica, Lord, and how they raise this child. The Lord, that they'll see the uniqueness in him. And they'll learn, Lord, how to raise their family collectively, but also separately. I thank you for this family today, Lord, and I bless them in your name. And I'm only speeding things up just a little bit because I'm sensing something in the spirit realm here. He's hungry. Well, if you want to feed him while I'm doing this, I've preached in many, many churches in Africa where feeding the child did not deter anyone from being in church. It only bothered the guy up there preaching. <laughs> oh. Come here, JMM. Oh. Isn't he awesome? Oh, oh there went his ninny. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I thank you for this beautiful baby, Lord. He's got ten fingers and ten toes. And the Lord, everything is functioning physically the way it's supposed to. Lord, we don't take that for granted. We thank you for that. Now, Lord, we're not sure what all you've predestined for this child. We just know that you have. And we're here today to align ourselves and agree with it. Lord, as Michael and Erica, as parents, and Lord, as extended family, agree with that. And Lord, I, as this child's pastor, agree. And Lord, this congregation, as church family, we all agree that we will do everything in our power, Lord, to raise this child in your ways, to observe and to notice the gifts of God, and Lord, to, to pull them out. So today, Lord, we just say amen to what you've designed for, for Jonathan, Lord. Lord, all the, 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 the intricate parts, Lord, emotionally and through his character and his nature, Lord, the things that, that you've put in him, Lord, that make up what you've called for in his destiny, we agree with it, Lord. Today, Lord, I just agree with you in blessing this child. I bless him physically and I bless him emotionally, Lord. I bless him, Lord, spiritually and Lord would even call even now for an awareness in his little spirit, man, Lord, of you. That even now, Lord, at a young age, that you would be active in his life. I thank you, Lord, that he has lungs where he can cry. And he can let us know when he's hungry. And he has the ability to eat. I thank you for this child and I bless him today, Lord, in your name. Hey, baby, John, John. Man, that wasn't so bad, was it? It wasn't. Oh, I got, it started as a grin and it went to a frown quickly. <laughs> Let's give them a hand for what they have done here, for it's a great thing. Thank you guys for being part of this. And this celebration doesn't end here. It's going to continue when the family leaves here. Just a beautiful time for families to be together for this. All righty then. I might need to sit down. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Thank you for being here on this summer Sunday. And we're getting through summer just fine. And we're not putting anything uh, on a hook. Putting anything, just laying it aside uh, while we're getting through summer. Waiting on people to finish vacation and everything. God is on a mission here at Cornerstone Family Church. And for several weeks now, we have been in a season called the Ripple Effect. And it's a very practical time of ministry. There are times that we plow deep into the oceans and we pull up kingdom concepts and spiritual things that, that almost make you go, whoa, I need some time to really facilitate that one. And there's other times and seasons where we take the kingdom of God and we make it very tangible and user-friendly because if we don't, then it's pointless. And this has been one of the most user-friendly seasons you will ever step into. And it's all based on, on, on the whole Word of God, but Paul sums it up in Galatians 6 and 7 when he says, 
Be not deceived. God will not be mocked in this. Whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. If he sows to righteousness, he will reap righteousness. If he sows to darkness, he will reap darkness. And we understand as the children of God that that is all tempered by grace. So God doesn't allow us to be crushed by our bad seed. But he definitely allows harvest to come forth to get our attention and to teach us and train us. And to use those harvests, even if they're bad harvests, to try to steer us towards a better path, a better way of living. Paul said, God will not be mocked in this, which means you will not be an exception. You will not be an exception. Your life, your life is primarily the ripple effect of the seed that you have sown in life. The Word of God makes it clear. We like to blame shift. We like to accuse many other people. We like to say it's the conditions of my life. I cannot help the condition I'm in. And there are some things that we can't help. But life has proven no matter how bad your conditions are, as a child of God, you've been given the power to recreate your world. Whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. And everybody in this room, for the most part, our life is a reflection of the seed that we have scattered in life. It's all about cause and effect. And I want to show you today one of the areas that we've talked about many times here at Cornerstone Family Church. But the, most, the single most primary area that if you will stay focused and you will become intentional, this is one area of seed scattering that will determine the outcome of your life more than anything else. There's many other things on the list. Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth things that we need to be aware of. But this is the primary area of life that if we can stay focused more than three days after you hear a sermon like this, stay focused to where it becomes a lifestyle, no matter what your life is like today, you will create a new world for yourself. Now, I'm a person who believes that the first thing that God showed us in His Word is the single most important thing He would ever want us to see. And that's why I wrote the book, The Architect of Eden, because I believe that almost everything God wanted us to see and needed us to see is all in the creation story. And everything after that is just redundancy. God's showing us the same pictures in different ways, different angles. I want us to go back to Genesis 1-1 today, and I want to show you the first thing that God wanted you to see about himself so that you would understand the first thing you needed to understand about yourself and when it comes to intentionally creating good ripples in your life. Look at this in Genesis 1-1. Well, I've got money in my way today. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's the first thing God wanted us to know. That's, that's where life begins in how you create your world. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And if we look at that, I want you to see that God was painting a picture that many people can relate to in life. Maybe some of you today would say, you know, that early picture of creation, that kind of describes my life. I just feel kind of empty. Formless means I really don't understand who I am, where I'm going. There's no form. I can't really look at my life and see an identity. I, I can't see who I am. I can't see where I'm going with my life. It's formless. And I feel empty. And if you're here today and you understand on any level battling depression, then you understand that darkness the darkness that was, that was hovering and filling. And God is showing us a picture of where life absolutely can find itself, formless and empty. There's a word here, a Hebrew word, that is the word chaos that is used here. And some of you can relate to that word. And when you take all these terms and you compile them together, it's represented in that Hebrew term that just means chaos. And some of you may would say, that's my life, just chaos. My marriage is chaos. My family, my children, my finances, my, my emotional health, 
my mental health. It's just chaos. And God is showing us a picture of this is what life can be. But he's wanting us to remember, but the Spirit of God is hovering over those waters in your life. He is there ready to empower, ready to empower some change. And so God introduces his kingdom concept now of how you take darkness, emptiness, formlessness, chaos, and how you turn it into something different. It says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. I want you to get away from the deep seas and the complications of God's word, at least how we make it complicated. And I want you to understand that when God gave us the the creation story, there was probably much more going on than what he gave us record of. But God intentionally gave us a very, very childish type story of where life began. Where everybody could understand. And it wasn't just in a historical record of here's who did it and here's how he did it. It was God trying to show us here's how life works. And God steps into an environment that is filled with chaos. It's dark. It's gloomy. It's depressed. It has no identity. It is lost. It is empty. It has no bearings in life. And God said, here's how you change that. And he spoke. And he said, let there be light. And there was light. It was God's first introduction to a system we call cause and effect. Cause and effect. We see the effect, there it is, but what caused that? What caused the chaos that was there? What caused the gloominess, the depression, the emptiness? Well, the same power that was now going to bring life is the same power that can bring death. And God didn't show us where all that started, but he sure showed us how to change it. Cause and effect. He spoke, and because he spoke words of life, life began to show up. And on day two, he stepped back out, and he saw the condition of his world, and he spoke, and there was a response. He was sowing seed and harvest would come back in. He was throwing stones in the water and it was causing a ripple effect. Every time God spoke, there was a ripple effect and that's what God wanted you to see in the creation story. That when he spoke words, there was a ripple effect that automatically was induced. Hannah asked me yesterday, and I don't know if she had heard me talking about this season that we're in. I don't know if it's something that they've talked about in kids' church. But she asked me in the car yesterday, and she got, she got a little mixed up at first. She said, Daddy, is it true that you sow what you reap? And I said, well, baby, you got that a little bit backwards. It's you, you, you reap what you sow. And she said, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. Is it true that you, that you reap what you sow? And I said, yeah, baby, the, the Bible's very clear about that. And she said, well, what exactly does that mean? And I started trying to explain to her what it means about sowing and reaping. And she stopped me in the middle of it and she said, oh, she said, so what what you're saying is what goes around comes around. I said, thank you. Why are you asking me? I should be asking you these questions. She instantly simplified. She said, oh yeah, Miss Presley, my teacher last year, she told us about that. She said, it's what goes around comes around. I said, exactly. That's what it is. What goes around comes around. It's cause and effect. And God in his first model of creation is showing us this is how life works. You speak words, it causes ripples, and it becomes the world that you live in. For six days, God spoke and things began to change. What was chaos began to turn into order. What was darkness began to turn into light. What was emptiness became filled with fruitfulness. And what started as a catastrophe ended in a day of rest. A beautiful garden, a beautiful life. Not a perfect life. There was a serpent lurking there. It wasn't a perfect life, but it was a beautiful life. 
Can you believe today that despite life's imperfections, that you can have a beautiful life? God has predestined you to have a beautiful life. A fruitful life. And we ask ourselves, how do we find this rest in our life? How do we find this fruitfulness in our life? These trees were producing fruit that produced fruit. And it was a continuous thing, perpetual harvest. And God showed us the model. Here's how I do it. I speak. And when I speak, there's a ripple effect. My words are like seed that I'm scattered in the earth. And they bring back forth a harvest. It's the first thing God showed us. The second thing that God showed us was, by the way, you're just like me. I've made you in my image. You are a reflection of me. Not in how tall I am, how wide I am, the color of my eyes, the color of my hair. God is spirit. God doesn't have those features. So when God said, I've made you in my image, he had, it had nothing to do with how we physically appear. It had everything to do with how we operate, how we were designed. Made in the image of God. The only thing that we knew about God prior to Him saying, you're just like me, the only thing we knew was that when God spoke words, it caused a ripple effect and it produced life. It changed things. The whole creation story revolves around characters that are speaking. God comes to Adam after He says, you're just like me. And the first assignment he gives Adam, he says, I want you to go into the garden and I want you to name the animals. And whatever you call them, that is what they will be. Now, we don't know what Adam called them. Adam didn't call a giraffe a giraffe and an elephant an elephant. He didn't even speak our language. Some of you may assume that everyone in the world calls an elephant an elephant, and that's not true. If you've been to other cultures where they speak different languages, they have their own words. The Bible had its own words. What the Bible called a, 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 a behemoth, probably, I got that out, probably was an elephant. What the Bible called a leviathan was probably a crocodile. But there in that moment, in that time, and in that culture, God said, whatever you say, whatever you speak, it will be established in the heavens. Whatever you call it, that's what I'm going to call it. And he was trying to teach Adam the power of the spoken word. The power of the seeds that we spew from our mouth. That they will not return void any more than God's words return void. And how many of you guys have ever said something and you wish you could reach out there and grab it and pull it back? Can I see your hand? How many of you guys have learned that it just doesn't work that way? When the seed goes out, it goes in the ground for better or for worse. How many times do we regret the things that we've said? We've seen the destruction, the damage. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have said that. How many times do we say something and as soon as it comes out, oh, we realize we made a mistake. Well, oh, I'm just kidding. I didn't really mean that. I, I take that back. How many of you guys have learned that when you say, I take that back, it doesn't really come back? God is saying, here's how life works. We're going to start with a mess and I'm going to speak to it and just based on the words that I speak it's going to completely radically transform and recreate this world human beings you're just like me the power of the spoken word Adam go name the animals I want you to understand how this works whatever you say whatever words come out of your mouth that's what it's going to be there's a serpent lurking he was the craftiest most cunning beast of the field we understand that internally that was representing the devil, but we don't understand the physical form that he was in the serpent. We play it off as a snake, and that's not even remotely right. It was probably an upright walking creature, and it had a voice, and it was speaking. He opens his mouth, and he begins to speak to humanity. And because of the words that flow out of his mouth, a ripple effect is created. And because of words that are spoken, humanity falls. God comes to humanity and He begins to speak to humanity. And humanity speaks back to God. And because of the words that was now coming out of humanity's mouth, a curse was established. 
Man began to speak words of blame shifting and scapegoating. And because of the words that was coming out of Adam and Eve's mouth, now there's a ripple effect and there's a cause and there's an effect. There was seed and now there's a harvest. And everything that has happened, every single thing that has happened in the creation story is the ripple effect of words that have been spoken. It's amazing how we miss the simplicity of this. Every single event of the creation story is the ripple effect of words that are spoken. Spoken by God. Spoken by man. Spoken by the serpent. Everything is the effect of one cause. Words. Words. Man speaks. Ripples ensue. This is what Solomon was talking about in Proverbs 18.21, a passage we've used here many, many times through the years. When he said, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. What fruit? The fruit of life and of death. Solomon saw that. He understood that. He was a very wise man. He observed humanity. He watched life. He no doubt had a lot of good and bad memories from his own father, King David, when there were words of life that his father spoke and they saw the creation of it. And there were other words that he saw his father speak that produced death. Jesus would declare these same words of Solomon's a little bit different. Look here in Matthew 12, 36. Jesus saying the same thing, only a different way. He says, but I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoke. Every careless word. This is Jesus' way of saying, you need to understand there are power, there's power in your words. Life and death, they are seeds and they are spewed unto the earth and they are what creates your very world. Our emotional world today is a creative product of our own lips. Our mental health is a reflection of the words that we have spoke or that somebody else has spoke to us. Today, the things that we battle from low self-esteem to insecurities to all kinds of fear, all of those things exist because of words that somebody has spoke. My daughter has a fear of spiders and granddaddy long legs, which she cannot separate. She can't separate them because my wife can't separate them. My daughter will pick up snake. We went to, um, Becky keyed us in on a really good event last week, last month, this past Monday at Craft Library in, a, in Bluefield with uh, Snakes Alive. And so, you know, Hannah wanted to go and, and so kids were over there holding all kinds of corn snakes and milk snakes and black snakes and, and just all kinds of things. These are all big snakes, a, uh, about a 130 pound boa constrictor. They were all lining up and holding that thing. And Hannah wanted to hold the head. She had to hold the head and she loved snakes. She's not afraid of snakes because I'm not afraid of snakes. And I had a chance to influence her before anybody else put fear in her. I didn't get there in time for spiders. My daughter is afraid of spiders for one reason, because my wife is afraid of spiders. Now, that's a little simple, insignificant thing. I'm not telling you you don't need to be afraid of spiders. There's more poisonous spiders around here than there are poisonous snakes, actually. My simple point is this. Much of the makeup of our life, of who we are, we are the result of words that were spoke to us. Some of you are afraid of water because the whole time you were grown up, you had a mother or a father just always saying, stay away from that water, you're going to drown. And so you assumed if I get around water, I will drown. And so you've always had a fear of water. Same could be said for fear of heights, fear of, fear of flying, fear of, of many different things that, that those were not innate. It is not innate. You can take a baby and you can put them in any situation on a high ladder in an airplane, or let a spider run all over them. You can do anything to a baby and a baby is not afraid of that because a baby has not been programmed by words yet. Most of our fears are the results of words. Most of our insecurities, 
Most of our low self-esteem that we battle, they're all the result of seed that has been scattered into our life. And much of that seed by somebody other than ourself. Our world is the creation of words, of words. The Bible, from cover to cover, focuses constantly and consistently on this power of life and death that's in the tongue. Much of the biblical instruction that we have deals with words. Good words, bad words. Great apostles such as Paul, constantly and consistently in almost every letter to the church, dealing in some way with words, the power of words, and the, 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 the fruitfulness or the destruction they can bring. The Bible warns us about speaking proud words, insincere words, flattering words, enticing words, hasty words, foolish words, malicious words, slanderous words, gossiping words, and what James would call curse words, which is not four-letter words. Cursing just means anytime you're speaking anything negative about anybody in the body of Christ. Cursing. And we have a hard time with these things in America, especially in America, because we're so programmed with, with, with weird ideologies that justify behavior. We're... we're we are programmed to think that it's okay to slander or talk about somebody if they hurt us first. I love that story of David. Even when Saul is trying to kill him, David will not speak a single evil word about Saul because that was still God's son. Saul was still God's son, and God handpicked Saul to be king. That was God's man. That was God's king. And, and if someone needed to deal with, with Saul, it was God's job to deal with him, not David's. David would not even speak an evil word against him. We're just so opposite of that. We feel so justified to slander because somebody hurt us. And I've shared with you many times um, here through the years, one of the most unfair things in life is when we get mad at somebody and then we, 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 we connect with somebody mutual there that knows them and knows us. And then we go out of our way to slander that person and to change, intentionally change that person's opinion because somehow there's revenge, there's retribution in that. I hate you and if I can get some more people to hate you, it makes me feel good. And I want you to know that is pure evil and you will be held accountable and judged for that kind of seed. Don't take my word for it. Take Jesus' word. And there's many people, many wonderful, kind people in the body of Christ that has just been, just been honestly hurt by people. I mean, crushed. Their spirit offended. And a lot of times, you were reasonably innocent in it. And it hurts so bad that, that we feel like we've got to get justification here. We've, we've got to get payback. We've got to somehow even the playing field and make this thing fair. We've got to get them back. And the primary way we get people back is with this right here. But someday we're going to have to grow up. And we're going to have to understand life is not about who they are. It's about who we are. My life can't be dictated by other people. I can't control other people. Whatever they do, whatever they say, I, I, I can't operate just on impulse and payback and retribution, and revenge. At some point, I have to decide if I'm going to be who God made me to be or not. Am I going to be me? And I'm going to be the son of God that God made me to be. It can't be about you. It can't be about what someone else does to me. And the Bible warns us about speaking these words of death because they're, it's cause and effect. They're causing ripples in our life. And there's nothing sadder than somebody who gets innocently hurt. And now they're ignorant to the fact that they're hurting themselves more than the person who originally hurt them. Because now they're responding out of hurt. They're angry. They're bitter. And we see it in broken marriages all the time. And we're hurting ourselves more than that person hurt us. Because God has already planned in every loss to turn that thing for good. God specializes in making lemonade. 
And whatever happens in your life, whatever brokenness, whatever loss, God already knew that was going to happen and God's already got a plan in place to turn that for good for you. But we shoot ourselves in the foot because we can't control this. And that's why James said, as a world of hurt spewing from this, man, we're setting our whole life. James says, we set our own lives on fire through this. And we think it's everybody else. I'm telling you, whatever someone has done to you, that's the least of your problems, really. Your biggest problem is this. The Bible doesn't just speak about, about the words of, of death that, we, that flow from our mouths. It speaks of the good seed. Encouraging words. Pleasant words. Gracious words. Comforting words. Inspiring words. Wise counsel words. Kind words, words of thanksgiving, and words of praise, loving words, words that James would call blessings in people's lives, words that bring peace where there has been chaos, words that bring healing where there's been damage and destruction. Look at this, what, what, uh, what Solomon says about words that can heal in Proverbs 16:24. He says, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. What's Solomon saying? Solomon's saying, look, we're just like God. And if we can learn to speak words of life into other people's lives, if I can sow seed into your life, words of life, words that encourage you, words that build you up, words that inspire you, kind words, not rude words. Words that, that make you feel good about who you are. Words that encourage you that you can go beyond where you're at. Words that bring healing to you when you've been beat up. Then the Bible confirms that if I speak that kind of seed into your life, that is the fruit that I will reap back into my own life. You show me someone that everyone's gossiping about, and I'll show you someone that's gossiped about everybody else. It's their harvest. You show me someone that everyone is speaking evil against, I'll show you someone that has spoke evil against everybody else. It's their harvest. You show me someone that says, says, everybody's just so rude to me and so mean to me. Welcome to your harvest. You created this world, now live in it. You speak it, you reap it. That's my catchphrase that I want to leave with you today. Got to have one catchphrase. It's not an American sermon if we don't leave with a catchphrase. Say that. You speak it, you reap it. You are not an exception, by the way. You will not be justified and God will not change the kingdom principles for you just because you were hurt or damaged. I don't care how unfair it was. God looks at it and says, I don't care who they are. Who are you? Who are you going to be? So when Jesus comes on the scene... And he's blowing everybody's mind. Just when you think he can't take it a notch higher, he does. And it sets everybody off. Because in their culture, even in their religious culture, they said, oh, eye for an eye. And Jesus said, um, I say, pray for your enemies and be kind to them. Well, how do we express kindness beyond words? There's very, we're very limited in how we can be kind to people. Outside of words. Why was Jesus saying that? Because those people deserved for us to be nice to them? No, because Jesus understood this ain't about them. This is about you, dude. You create your world. You don't like your world? Recreate it. How do you recreate it? The same way you created it the first time. These words of life and death are not just about the words and the syllables and the letters themselves. But it's about the tone. Look at this in Proverbs 15.1. The wise King Solomon. He says, The gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. We are in control with our words and the tone of our words, whether we're creating peace or catastrophe, whether we're making people mad or glad. In our marriages, especially in our marriages, we are in 100% control all the time of the mood of our marriage. The words that we're speaking, the tone. Are we speaking words that are non judgmental, non accusatory? Or are we doing just the opposite? Speaking words that are accusatory, are judgmental. 
People bring their marriages to me all the time, and we try to delve into it and figure out where do we start working on this thing. And it's, it's so often just a mess because of the words that people are speaking to each other and the tone of it. And they just incite each other. That's why the Bible says, parents, don't, don't incite your children to wrath. How do we do that? With our words. That's why we're always saying, choose your battles carefully with your children. Don't exasperate your children constantly in their face, nagging at them. Let them go off and make a few little mistakes. Only nag when it's a big thing. You'll exasperate your children with what? With your words. The number one reason most children rebel against their parents is one reason. Words. They're sick of the words they're hearing from their parents. That's why the Bible warns us about it. Words, 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 words. Every marriage in this room right now is the expression of the words that have been spoken. Hateful words, mean words, accusatory words, judgmental words, rude words, then that's the kind of marriage you've got. You show me a great marriage, I'll show you a marriage where there's a man and there's a woman that speak kind to one another. They are not rude. They don't accuse each other in their, in their conversations. They're not judging each other. They're speaking words of life, and now their marriage has life because their marriage is the harvest of their words. Marriage is not a harvest of economic status. Marriage is not a harvest of where you live or where you don't live, where you work, where you don't work. Marriage is not, the, 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 the condition of your marriage is not the expression of your physical health. Your marriage is almost entirely the expression of your words. I've been to some really poor countries, and all they had were the words they could speak to one another. It's all it takes. It's all it takes. The words, the words. If you speak it, you're going to reap it. You know what that means when I turn that over? Absolutely nothing. It means I'm done with my outline so I can really start preaching now. I'm getting out of the box now, baby. Guys, we said we're going to make this season so user-friendly. Our life is the expression of the ripple effect we have created. And we're going to, we have talked about some things and we're going to talk about some other things. Just the ripple effect from servitude, from serving. Um, God makes very clear we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna, going to um, focus a little more on it on one Sunday. God, God just goes so out of his way to focus on the ripple effect of bringing tithes and offerings in the storehouse that if we miss that, man, we're, we're, just, we're committing spiritual suicide if we do. God's being so intentional about that and being kind and so many things and the servitude thing is just so huge. But I'm telling you, this is probably the single biggest area that we're messing our own lives up. And that's why it's the first thing that God showed us. It's the first thing God showed us. A world is created by the words spoken. The power of life and death is in the tongue. Jesus says, we're going to hold everybody accountable for one primary thing in life. What, Jesus? All of our many sins? No, I took care of that at the cross. I knew you couldn't take care of that one. What I'm going to hold you accountable for one is the, is the one that I can't do for you that's in your own power. What's that, Jesus? Your words. Your words. Your words. How many's ever known somebody just mean-spirited, always spewing mean words? You ever notice how they, nobody blesses them? They, they walk in no favor in life? Have you, have you seen the kind of world that they live in? You don't want that, do you? That's why it doesn't matter who they are. If you go to Kroger's and the cashier is in a bad mood that day and not being nice, we don't retaliate. We don't respond. Not the way that they just enticed us to respond. We don't fight fire with fire. It's not eye for an eye. That cashier is not even my enemy. But Jesus said, pray for your enemies and be kind to them. Have you ever noticed when, when, when Solomon talks about how a soft word can turn away wrath, how many of you guys have ever experienced that someone comes to you and they're all stirred up, they're upset about something, but if you can maintain your composure and begin to respond back with soft words, with words of life, with kind words, how, have you noticed how quick you can diffuse a situation? I mean quick. We just need a little self-control. 
It's incredible how you can take a chaotic situation and bring peace into it just by the words that you speak. That's why years ago, I finally, finally woke up, smelled the coffee, and learned that when people come to me and they tell me how mad they are at me or how hurt they are because I've missed something, I, I want to be able to explain myself. I want to be able to, ju to, to justify myself. But I've learned that something had to have happened there, and it may not have been intentional, but I have obviously missed something. And the first thing I need to do before I ever try to explain myself is I need to apologize. Because clearly I did something. It's not always everyone's imagination. How I many of you guys are still living in that world? That everybody else is just battling imaginations thinking that you've done all these things wrong. And really you've done nothing wrong. You really think that's right? That is not right. I told you nine people come to you and say you've got a booger hanging out on your nose. By the time number ten comes, you better be grabbing a Kleenex. Everyone's not just trying to be mean to you and set you up. If you have friends, it's because you've learned how to reap that harvest with your words. If you have no friends, you are living in the harvest of your words or lack of words. Our world, your life, my life, is the expression of the ripple effect we have caused by our words. God was kind. He said, but look, I'll show you the worst case scenario. It's formless. It's just a big void, a big hole. It's empty. It's chaotic. It's, it's a mess. But I want to teach you something because you're just like me. Watch what I do here. And he begins to speak words of life. He speaks words of life. And that world is recreated. You have the power to recreate your marriage with nothing more than this. Recreate the dynamic between you and your children. The conditions you're in in your, in your workplace, it's a result of words that are being spoke, not your paycheck. We have the power. You speak it, you reap it. You speak it, you reap it. I'm not talking about vain flatteries, but it's time to start bragging on each other. We're so quick to tell everybody what's wrong with someone else, but we're not very quick to tell everybody what's so right about other people. How many of you guys want people to brag on you? If you want that harvest, you've got to sow that seed. How many of you guys want people to be kind to you with how they talk to you? If you want that harvest, you've got to speak that seed. You've got to throw that seed out. You have the power to induce that ripple effect. You want people to, to talk good about you and show you favor and bless you? Then you have to create that harvest. You have the power to create that harvest. It's not anybody else. It's just you. You have the power. You speak it. You reap it. For better or for worse. Now, we're going to pray this morning. And uh, you know what it means when I turn my phone over? That usually means I'm getting ready to pray. Um, I told you about an evangelist I traveled with many, many years ago when I was just a kid, and we had a, uh, keep this under wrap, but a, a, a gospel quartet. And, uh, and, uh, and he would preach, we'd sing, and he would preach, and, and uh, he would talk about um, the sins of the tongue a lot. He'd go to give an altar call and he'd say, we just need to come and lay our tongues on the altar today. He'd say, some of y'all, your tongue wouldn't fit on the altar if it stretched from here to Texas. But we're going to pray for you anyway today. He was being tongue-in-cheek about it. I'm glad y'all got that. I didn't want to waste that. We've, how many times have we talked about the power of life and death here through the years? How many times have we said, come on, let, let, let's let the Lord sanctify our speech and we'd gather around this altar? And we've never talked about this, that pretty much everyone in the room didn't walk out very conscious, very awake, very alert, and for several hours after that, just very intentional. 
But I'm telling you, if we don't learn to get our focus in life and turn some of this stuff into a lifestyle, we're going to battle our whole life with our world when God designed for us to have a beautiful garden of Eden. That's how he, that's how he, he demonstrated. And, and I know that Adam and Eve physically got removed from that place, but you need to understand spiritually 2,000 years ago, the way was open for you to go right back in there. For 2,000 years, the way has been opened for humanity to, to return to that Garden of Eden scenario and live there in that beautiful life, a fruitful life, a, a life of peace and joy and rest. And I'm telling you, if we've got to make a list and we're looking for number one today, what's the number one problem in humanity's life, especially in the body of Christ? We're talking about it today. We make this one adjustment and we're going to reverse some curses. We're going to transform some marriages. We're going to bring some healing into some people's lives. We're going to find some healing in our own lives. How many of you guys need some healing in your life? Well, sow it. Sow some healing with some healing words in other people's life. God will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow. That's a good thing too. You speak it, you reap it. Stand with me this morning. Uh, for anyone here today who would say, Pastor Scott, I appreciate the user-friendly information today. How does that affect me? I'm really not a child of God. I'm not, I'm not, I have not given my life to Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm so far away from him. And um, so how does this apply to me? I'm here to tell you today Sadly, it does not apply to you in the same way. Uh, you're the ultimate expression of being lost in life. And trying to implement this instruction today in a life that is lost will not save your life and it will not fix your conditions and it will not create your world because your words will not be empowered by the very anointing of God who wants to live inside of you. And so I want to pray for you first. That if you're here today and you say, Pastor Scott, I don't know Jesus today. I have not given him my life. In fact, I've been intentionally running from him. I feel like I'm a billion miles away from God. I want you to know that can change today in the moment, in the twinkling of eye. Because what you don't understand is, is you're already saved. You just haven't accepted it. You were saved 2,000 years ago. You just got to find a faith today to receive that for yourself and embrace it and take ownership of salvation and that's simple it's just a little simple matter of the heart saying yes lord i believe what pastor scott just told me i give you my life i accept the salvation you earned for me two thousand years ago on the cross i embrace it i accept that i give you ownership of my life today Put me on that potter's wheel they were singing about. Start spinning me round and round like you own me. It's just that simple. And so, Father, I do. I lift anyone up today who would say, that's me. I'm lost today. I don't know who I am. I don't know where I'm at in life. I know it's because I'm running from God. I stand with them, Lord, as in simple faith. They give you their life and just say, Jesus Christ, take my life today. Take ownership of my life. I give it to you I thank you, Lord, that our sins have been forgiven. And simple faith based on your word and not our feelings today, Lord, assures us that that has taken place. Even now, Lord, I pray for an intimacy of your spirit to begin to wash through the lives and the hearts and the minds of those who would say, Jesus, I give you my life today. And Holy Spirit, Fire them up, Lord, now to, to, to graft into this place, to connect with this people, with this church, with this house, so that we can disciple them and train them and teach them, Lord, how to be a child of God. For all the rest of us, Lord, I'll be the first to admit, Lord, my single biggest problem in my life is my mouth. I speak a lot of life, Lord, and... I keep shooting myself in the foot because I'm spewing some really bad seed out too. I'll be the first to admit, Lord, that there are areas of my life that is in a condition that I don't like, but it's a reflection of my own ripples. 
today, Lord, I'm freshly, newly convicted by your word to make this even more and more my lifestyle, my nature, Lord, to guard my mouth, to open it and spew seed that brings life. And when there's seed dangling at the the front of the seed bag, Lord, that I know is going to bring death, that I'll just zip the bag back up and keep it in there. Lord, for the people out here today who feel justified in, in releasing that seed that's causing bad ripple effect, I pray that you will help them understand today this is about who they are, not about who the person is that hurt them. And I pray, Lord, for anyone here today who would see themselves as an exception on any level, that your spirit would help them to see they are not an exception and convince everyone here that they can completely recreate their life, Lord. Completely recreate their life through this one kingdom principle of sowing and reaping. They can reverse their curse. I thank you for this house today. And today we bless you, Jesus. We love you. And I say to you, Cornerstone Family Church, go in peace. Eat your Wheaties this week. Don't just grit and bear, but absorb these next, this next two weeks. Treasure it for the opportunity that it is to reach out to 400 kids, maybe more. Give your life away with gladness, not with regret, and not being stingy about it. Give your life away and then swim in the ripple effect. Bless you guys.